Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. Alhamdulillahi rabbil alamin. Wal aqibatu lil muttaqin wa la udwana illa 'ala adh-dhalimin. Wa usalli wa usallimu 'ala man bu'itha rahmatan lil alamin. Nabiyyina Muhammad wa 'ala alihi wa ashabihi ajma'in. إخواني في الله حياكم الله وبارك فيكم. Um, today I want to do a very brief uh, reminder um, on the importance of self ruqya Now, the reason why I am doing this reminder now um, is I don't know uh, whether you brothers and sisters are aware. Um, but I have my telephone number up on uh, Facebook and uh, people contact me and they message me with questions and queries and seeking advice for Rukia related issues and other issues as well in general. And Wallahi, one of the uh, things that I have learned um, from speaking to the general people, being in contact with the general people uh, from literally the four corners of the earth uh, is that there is a massive, massive need still to push uh, self rukya And before this, I wanted to speak about or to encourage the men folk as well, uh, the brothers, those who have uh, women folk who are affected or afflicted. Uh, because subhanallah, the uh, the sisters in general, our sisters, they are in a very desperate situation when it comes to uh, ruqya. So ikhwani fillah, when it comes to self ruqya, then there are a few things online. Um, and you know myself, brother uh, Ustad Muhammad Tim Hanbal, hafizahullah, um, you know, we've done things uh, encouraging people to make self ruqya, encouraging people to, you know, take charge of their own treatment, to do what they can. As relates to the brothers, now, I want to focus on the brothers. Before we go into self ruqya, I want to focus more on, on, on the brothers because, you know, um, in my opinion, in every single family, there should be at least one brother or two. Uh, who have knowledge of Ruqya, so that if, you know, may Allah uh, prevent this and, and not uh, allow this to happen, but if one of your women folk is affected or one of your family members is afflicted, then there should be a brother who, you know, it doesn't need to be an expert in Ruqya, he doesn't need to know the ins and outs and be really experienced, but he should just have a basic knowledge. Because, you know, subhanAllah, we have so many sisters who are suffering and then they have to go and they have to go to this Raqi and that Raqi. And this is if they can find somebody to make Ruqya over them. You know, uh, subhanAllah, um, right now, and I'm only speaking from for the, for the UK, okay? Right now, um, if somebody contacts me and says, you know, I want to have Ruqya done, who can you recommend? Literally, I always say to them, there are brothers, but I don't work with them, nor do I recommend anybody. And the reason why this is, is because, subhanAllah, some people are charging 80 pounds, 100, 200, 300 pounds for one Rukia session. I want you to imagine that, okay? So, you know, there were brothers who started out doing Rukia a year ago or a year and a half, two years ago, opened a Facebook page, opened a Rukia center or whatever. And now they're charging 100, 200, 300 pounds for one Rukia session. And so we are making Rukia prohibitively expensive. Okay, where you know, subhanAllah, somebody's affected and all they can afford is one Rukya session. And this person might need two, three, four months of recitation, but all they can afford is one Rukya session. And you know, we're going to be held accountable on Yawm Al Qiyamah by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because we've closed off these doors. We've closed off the halal and so we are pushing the people to haram. Okay, and where you know it's like uh, Ruqya is only for the rich 
or those who can afford it. And if you can't afford it, khalas, we close the doors on you and we say, sorry, we can't fit you in. This is, a, this is oppression. And the ruqa, they need to fear Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That they are going to be questioned on yawm al-qiyamah. That what were you doing to help those brothers and sisters who you had the ability to help, you had the ability to assist, but the only reason you didn't assist them was because of money. Because they couldn't afford to pay you. This is a serious issue, ikhwani. And so, I'm, I'm really reaching out to the brothers here. That... You know, subhanAllah, say your wife has a problem, say your sister has a problem, your mother has a problem. I, do you really want to be ringing this raki, brother, I want to bring my mother to you, I want to bring my wife to you, how much do you charge? And then you go there and if she has a reaction and she, you know, she may get put into some vulnerable positions, etc. You don't want to be taking your wife to this man and that man and this man and that man. There needs to be an element of protective jealousy. And a man he is the shepherd and he is responsible for his flock and so your wife is from your flock and so you need to take charge of this and ikhwani subhanallah one thing that pains me is that there's a lot of material out there there's a lot of material available online now from the ruqya courses from brothers giving general advice from ruqa who are recording certain things and showing you how to do certain things but our problem is we are lazy we are lazy. And so honestly, we get people asking us questions which if they just went into Google even or if they just watched one video or, you know, I send somebody the link to my website uh, and, and, and they all the answers are on there. But they just want to be spoon fed when it comes to knowledge. And this is a problem. This is a problem. And so, you know, my brothers, I'm asking you for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, don't wait until you have a problem within your family to learn how to do ruqya. Don't wait how, you know, until you have a problem with your wife or a problem with your kids before you learn how to do ruqya. And then you have to go to one and the other and the other and it becomes difficult and you're driving up and down the country trying to, you know, put your hands out in front of the people. So, Ikhwani Fillah, uh, this is my plea to the brothers, the men folk, that part of being a man is that you are prepared to defend your family from the seen problems and also from the unseen problems. And, you know, subhanAllah, this is why, for example, when it comes to our kids, we, we uh, you know, we make adhkar for them and we uh, put them under the protection of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because they're not able to do that. And this is the, you know, this is part of, you know, this manliness that you care for your family, not only with, you know, protecting them from thieves and robbers and the likes, but also from the shayateen and from sihar and from the evil eye and things like this. And so we need to learn, ikhwani, we need to learn. And, uh, you know, it's a problem amongst our community now where people are scared. People are scared of the jinn, okay? And, you know, uh, I've, I've offered brothers in the past, I've said, look, guys, come together and I'm happy to teach you guys how to do ruqya, but on the condition that you go back and you assist your families and your communities and you're not going to turn it into a, you know, a crazy uh, business and you're just going to become another businessman Raqi. We don't need more businessmen Raqi, Raqis or Ruqa. We need brothers who are going to assist for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Meaning you have a job and you earn your income <coughs> and then you, you dedicate or you take some time out for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and you make Ruqya upon those who, who need it. Another thing that I want to um, focus on today is self Ruqya. Okay? Um, this is a, again, you know, I get people who don't pray five times a day, yet they are seeking ruqya and they're worried and they're thinking about why their problems are, you know, not going away. They don't pray. I get people, who, for example, they will go to the Sikhs and they will go to the Hindus and they will go to all sorts of people and then they come to me. And they don't know what ruqya is. So, for example, I had one person yesterday or the day before said, brother, I need ruqya. And my mom's name is this and my name is this and my uh, my father's name is this. And, you know, like, uh, you know, sometimes they want to send me pictures of themselves because they think that ruqya is what is exactly what the people who are working with jinn. They think that ruqya is this because 
you know, like the Beat Sabs and the Maulanas and the magicians, they've cottoned on now. They've cottoned on. So they don't call it now Ruhani Ilaj or spiritual healing or anything. They don't call it that anymore. They will say what we are doing is Ruqya. And so the person thinks, ah, yeah, Ruqya, but he doesn't know what Ruqya is. And so, you know, it's like what Ibn al-Qayyim, rahimahullah, he mentioned that when a person has no knowledge, you know, you bring him sand and you tell him that this is gold. You bring him dust and you tell him that this is gold. And just because it is a similar color, he doesn't have any knowledge and he thinks that this is gold because he doesn't know what gold is in reality. And so it's upon us to, uh, you know, to learn about these things. And I'm going to tell you, how many messages I get because I don't want you to think, you know, he's just talking uh, about something that doesn't really exist. In three days, I get up to 200 messages. So in three days, I get 200 messages. And these are people who have problems and it's not from one part of the world. As I said, it's from every single part of the world. Think about that in three days, 200 messages. This is a serious issue. And I wish that there were brothers who I could just say, you know, there's this brother here in London, there's this brother here in Manchester, there's this brother here in, you know, in the States or this part of the States. And I wish that we could do this. But the problem is, Ikhwani Fillah, that sadly, uh, you know, subhanAllah, uh, there are, the brothers are few and far between. Ikhwani, this is what I have to uh, advise you brothers with and sisters as well with regards to Ruqya and South Ruqya. I'm not going to say too much more. And the reason for this is because there's a lot already out on the internet, even from myself, from Brother Muhammad Tim, from the both of us together, from other brothers as well, encouraging you with Ruqya, teaching you Ruqya, trying to, you know, uh, explain to you how to do it, what to do, what not to do, what to look out for. And so it's out there, but you need to go out and you need to uh, look for it. That's the first thing. And the second thing that I want to um, touch upon is a completely separate issue. And it's something that I've seen from scrolling on, on Facebook. Um, is the fitna of social media and how it and how people, they speak in a way which they wouldn't normally do if you were in front of one another. So, you know, like a, a video, for example, of a, of a brother and he's talking or he's advertising a particular thing or he's pushing his business or he is speaking on a subject. And then the sisters are commenting and saying how, uh, you know, mashallah, uh, Allahumma barik, how handsome he is or, you know, and, and saying, you know, we should go and visit him and, and, and speaking without any without any uh, shame or without any decency. And these are not sisters who are non-practicing from what is apparent. These are sisters who are, you know, hijab, jilbab, etc. And you just think, you know, if that individual was in front of you or if that person was in front of you, you wouldn't address them in this way. And likewise, um, you know, when when we find people commenting on our posts and, and other posts as well, the people speak in a way which is completely devoid of any mannerisms, completely devoid of any any akhlaq or, or, or even you know good characteristics. And so I want to remind you that what we say, even on social media, even though it's on a public platform and things like this, we need to observe the correct etiquettes when we are speaking to sisters. We shouldn't be, and, and brothers as well, we shouldn't be joking around. Um, you know, we shouldn't be commenting on sisters' posts and, and saying how, uh, you know, good looking they are or how, you know, mashallah, um, you know, they, they look good or this is that achievement, etc. We need to be careful of this, Ikhwani, because, uh, you know, Allah says, وَلَا تَتَّبِعُوا خُطُوَاتِ shaytan don't follow the footsteps of shaitan and so from the footsteps of shaitan is that you know a person does this and it leads to one thing and another and another and another and it can become a uh, a big fitna it can become a big fitna so this is a reminder to myself and you brothers and sisters as well that when we are you know on social media and we are uh, interacting with people we need to do it in a in a way which is uh, which is upright and which is which is just inshallah um, if you guys have any questions pertaining to Ruqya, inshallah, I'm more than happy to take them because I just wanted to come on and, uh, and, and mention these uh, brief words. Uh, so if you guys have any questions, then uh, fire away. Barakallahu feekum. Subhanakallahumma wa bihamdik. Ashadu an la ilaha illa anta astaghfiruka wa atubu ilayk. If you guys have any questions, um, then please go ahead. Uh, 
Um, so I've seen a question here. Uh, can a can a jinn stay in your body for years if ruqya is not done regularly? So um, you know, if if a person is not doing um, ruqya, then then yes, they can uh, stay in your body, and Allah Jalla wa Ala knows best for how long and things. But you know, it's not unheard of for a person to be uh, struggling with these types of issues for years on end, years and years on end. And so, it's very important to deal with these issues. You can't just you know put them under you know as they say, just sort of throw them under the, the the carpet or under the mat, just sweep them up because it's it's not going to uh, it's not going to uh, go away. And so uh, it's important to deal with these issues head on. And that's why I said, you know, we need men folk. So, for example, if your wife is suffering or if the brother himself is suffering, then, you know, we need a, a backup, uh, a backup structure. So that person is going to have up days and he's going to have bad days as well. So when he's up, we need to encourage him and we need to assist him. And when he's down, we need to support him. And often, you know, a person might get to a stage where they're so low that they're not able to, uh, you know, really push their ruqya themselves. So wouldn't it be great to just have somebody in your household, but at that moment he could sit down and he could, uh, you know, recite over you. Okay. Um, with regards to um, uh, ruqya audio, then again, there's lots of information on ruqya audio. But the, the, the crux of the issue is that ruqya audio is not ruqya. Okay, so Rukya audio, if a person has the ability to do Rukya, then Rukya audio is not sufficient and it's not enough. Rukya audio is only to be used for an individual who he's making Rukya over himself and then he just wants to supplement his Rukya uh, with, um, with, you know, a bit more and he, so he listens to Rukya audio. Or an individual who doesn't know how to recite, he's a revert, etc. So we give him the Rukya audio and say, look, it's okay for you to listen to this until you are able to recite. And the condition is, in the meantime, you must be learning how to recite. And honestly, I get people who are born Muslims, people who are born Muslims, and the, and, and the hard truth is, they're just too lazy to recite. They're just too lazy to recite. And so you can imagine it's very frustrating. Somebody comes to you and he complains, brother, I'm not getting better. I have, I've, I've had these problems for many, many years now, etc., etc. And you say to him, okay, so what does your ruqya consist of? And he says, oh, I, I listen to, I play Surat al-Baqarah in the house. And you say, so this is your ruqya? And he says, yes. And you know, the person knows that he needs to recite. The person knows that he needs to recite. But subhanAllah, he, he's just lazy and we spend hours watching TV, hours on Facebook, social media, etc. But when it comes to reciting, then we become lazy. And so it's very frustrating. And so that's why we always come in front of you and say, guys, come on, ruqya, ruqya, self ruqya, recite from the book of Allah, recite from the book of Allah. As for, um, you know, the, uh, the question is, you know, somebody asks a question and I'm just going to tweak that question is, um, I've been making ruqya on myself and I just get worse and worse and worse until I can't continue and then I stop for a little while and then I, when I start again, I'm back to where I was. So I'm back to square one. In reality, you know, I want you to, um, I give the example of when the marathon runner, he's running a marathon and they always say this, you're going to hit a wall. Okay, so he's running, 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 and he's making this effort. Now, this is you making the rukya, making the rukya, making the rukya. He says you're going to hit the wall. Okay, and when you hit this wall, you have to keep going, and eventually you'll break through the wall, and after that, it'll become easy, easy, easier, easier, easier. Okay, this wall I want you to imagine is your situation when you are at your lowest, you're at your worst moment. This is that wall now. If you stop, then you're going to lose all of your progress and you're going to go back to where you were, back to square one. But if you keep going and you break through this wall, this is where the progress is. And so Rukia brothers, Rukia, you know, like 60% or 50% of Rukia is sabr. Just being patient and just keep going, keep going, keep going, keep going. Don't stop and just, you know, power through, power through. Because these are the moments when you're at your worst, you're at your lowest, when your dua is going to be the most sincere, when you're going to turn back to Allah and trust in Him in the most 
pure way. When Allah Jalla wa ala sees your situation and you are doing everything that you can, it's usually, from my experience, when people get to these moments and then they keep going, that they break through and then they begin to improve by the permission of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But you know, it starts like, Rukya starts like this and then you go down and then you come back up. Usually when people go down, they stop. And so they just go straight back to where they were. This is not the right way to do it, uh, my brothers and sisters. We have to keep going and we have to uh, you know, keep uh, pushing through and get through that wall by the permission of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. As for if you have any books like the Naqsh Nuri or the Naqsh Sulaimani or whatever else, um, and you want to get rid of them, just go and buy a paper shredder and just shred the book inshallah just rip the pages out and shred the book and then once you have shredded the book then you can just burn it inshallah um okay the next question uh possession which is not obvious i.e jinn has not said anything but seems it's hiding is this possible okay i want to say something now and i don't want anybody to get put off by what i'm about to say but the more people that i am working with and the more people i come across the more i I'm trying to take a holistic approach to Ruqya uh, al-Shari'ya. And the reason why is because, you know, sometimes a person gets it into their mind that they are possessed. And all they ever think about is this possession. All they ever think about is the fact that I am possessed now. And so Shaytan, he launches a, a mental attack and he whispers to them, whisper, 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 any little pain, any little twitch, any little issue. Khalas, now this is the jinn. Okay, now... If the jinn is hiding and you're reading Ruqya, 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 Quran, Quran, Du'as, Tawbah, etc. And you're making hijama. For how long do you think that this shaitan can hide? And so what I say to people is, look, make Ruqya a part of your daily routine. Don't make Ruqya your entire day. Because if you make Ruqya your entire day, then you're opening yourself up for shaitan to come and whisper to you. You're not going to be working. You're not going to be doing anything. So I always say to people, make Ruqya, but don't let your life stop at the same time. And this is not from the, the sunnah, to the best of my knowledge, that a person just stops his life and he just wants to just, you know, make Ruqya. Because imagine there's the, the shayateen are trying to ruin your life and you sit at home and you start, you know, just reciting 24 hours a day and subhanallah, you get problems and you lose your job and then you've got financial issues and then you have problem upon problem upon problem. You're going to sit at home all day, you're going to become a recluse. So your health is going to begin to suffer. When your health begins to suffer, you're going to get, you know, fitness related uh, illnesses and so all of these issues will just come and pile up and up and up and up and it reminds me of Umar ibn al-Khattab radiyallahu ta'ala anhu where you know he found a, a group of people uh, you know sitting in the masjid and they were just sat in the masjid it was up the prayer time and Umar radiyallahu anhu he asked them what are you doing and they said oh you know we are people of tawakkul and you know we're making dua to Allah Jalla wa ala. and Umar radiallahu an he beat those people and he whipped them and he said you know that the sky it doesn't rain gold and silver meaning you know that you have to go out and earn a living you know that you have you know we live in this dunya we have to we have to interact with this dunya and it's not about just cutting off like this you know, like, like the, the Sufis who go and, you know, hide in a cave and don't interact with their wives and their families and their communities. No, khalas, we're not like these people. And so the, the point being is that, you know, this whole issue of the jinn is hiding, the jinn is hiding. I would ask a person like this, you know, there, there should be other signs and symptoms then which are leading you to a surety that you have a jinn problem. Okay, because if it's just uh, like I think the jinn is hiding and I'm making ruqya and I'm not getting any reaction, so the jinn is hiding. I would say, look, that means that you are you're jumping the gun. There needs to be other signs and symptoms as well, and we need to take a holistic approach. And Allah Subhanahu wa Taala knows best. Sister Aisha, she asks, "Salamu alaykum." I'm feeling feelings of fear and uh, and and being aggressive. In my personality lately, has there also been people that felt like they were possessed by feeling another personality in their own self? Again, all I'm going to say is I hope that you've made Ruqya upon yourself. And if you haven't, then you need to start. 
okay because it's very dangerous for me now to say yes there have been people like this because immediately you're going to think ah maybe i'm like those people who are possessed and you haven't made the ruqya and already shaitan has got you wrapped up and we're causing problems for you so what i would suggest to you sister is for you to uh, begin with the ruqya begin with the fasting on mondays and thursdays of course you know before any of this your five daily prayers before any of that you need to fix your aqidah make sure that your creed is the correct creed you believe as the Prophet وسلم, and his companions believed, you believe, you know, you're not making dua to others besides Allah, you're not making dua to the Messenger of Allah, you don't believe that he's from the Noor of Allah, you don't believe that he has knowledge of the unseen, you don't believe that, you know, you can make tawaf around the graves, you don't believe that there's any type of hidden knowledge in Al Islam. The, all of these different things, all of the hocus pocus rubbish that people believe, you believe the way the Messenger of Allah alayhi salatu salam he uh, believed. Okay, so fix your aqidah, pray five times a day. It might be that, you know, um, you're engaged in a particular sin. It may be that you are engaged in a particular sin because you know that sinning, it, it makes the heart constricted and it makes the heart black and it causes problems and it causes depression. So you know that sinning, you know that sinning, it constricts a person and it, and it makes their life difficult. Okay, man a'rada an dhikri fa inna lahu ma'ishatan dhanka. Whoever turns away from my remembrance, Allah says, he's going to have a difficult life, a depressed life, a constricted life. And so one of the punishments of the sin in this dunya is that it makes a person's life constricted and it makes their it makes their affairs seem difficult and they're always stressed. And Allah says, Allah bi dhikrillahi tatma'inul qulub. Indeed, in the remembrance of Allah do hearts find rest. So the aggressiveness, it might be that. Or you might be going through, you know, according to your age, some changes, some hormonal changes, etc. Women go through them, whatever it is. You might be stressed with the affairs of the dunya, you know. And so you can go back and read the du'as from the sunnah, you know. And... Allahumma inni a'udhu bika min al-hammi wal-hazan wal-ajazi wal-kasal, etc. Go back and read these du'as. Do everything that's within your ability as per the sunnah. And then on top of that, introduce ruqya. And then inshallah, you will have a clear idea whether it's yourself or whether it's not. And you know, I say this to every person, every single person who is watching this, who will watch this later, inshallah. If you have the ability, go and make umrah. If you have the ability, go and make the Umrah, okay? How many people, they are going to Dubai, they're going to Spain, they're going to Morocco, they're going to the Philippines, they're going here, there and everywhere to the four corners of the earth. If you have the money, Wallahi, I swear to you by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, I swear to you by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that trip to Umrah and that your, your performing of the Umrah and being in Mecca and Medina, I promise you it's going to be better for you than any other place on the face of this earth. It's going to relax you. Your heart is going to feel peace and tranquility. You're going to be able to go there and make tawbah. It's an opportunity for you to seek forgiveness from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, a fresh start. Wallahi, honestly, it's the best thing. It's like, you know, when you have a on your internet explorer or your internet browser and it's stuck and it's frozen, it's moving really slowly and you press that refresh button, suddenly everything reloads. This is like making Umrah, you know, or making the Hajj and we've just passed the Hajj season. Go and make the Umrah. And you know, if you have the money and you don't go, honestly, you're a miskeen. If you have the money and you don't go, you're a miskeen. Because honestly, you're missing out on something amazing you're missing out on something amazing and so you know my uh, advice to you sister is you know if you feel that these things and i'm not going to give you a like a one size fits all answer because i don't know you and your situation and your life and your past and your history and and you know your personality so it's impossible for me to uh, you know say that yes this will be jinn or or it's not going to be jinn so i would just give a um you know i would i would just give a uh, a general answer and if you feel there are jinn in the house like you mentioned in the next um, question recite Surah Al-Baqarah in your home and again if you go on my website then there are uh, then there are uh, ways to get the shayateen out of your house and you can follow those inshallah I don't want to uh, repeat that here inshallah um, this is a good question with regard to children's toys 
uh, those with faces because we know that the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam he mentioned that the angels don't enter a home in which there is a, an image okay um, or a, a, a picture so you know a lot of our toys today they have uh, faces on them and you know the, the kids toys are very difficult yes although you can get um, you know toys without the faces and this is something that's happening now and it is a, a, you know a growing market at the same time, um, it's very difficult and you know, my advice to brothers and sisters, okay, is be practical, you know, we live in the West and you can shut your child off from everything, you can shut them off from absolutely everything, but how long are you going to do that for? How long are you going to do that for? How long are you going to, you know, wrap them up in a cotton wool ball? Because we need to give them the tools to go out and deal with the dunya, with the with the affairs of the, the dunya. Okay? We need to go out and deal with the affairs of the dunya. You know, subhanAllah, give them the tools. And so, that's just a general advice. When it comes to the actual, um, the sorry, I'm just being uh, distracted by somebody making uh, takfir on me here. Um... And I'm going to leave him, Just let's see what he says. In any case, when it comes to the, uh, the situation with regards to the toys and the faces, if you have the ability to avoid that, then this is best, without a shadow of a doubt. Okay? If, however, if, however uh, you, you, know, you can't avoid it or, or you, know, you, you have toys with faces on there, then my advice is, inshallah, once your uh, children have played with them, then, you know, put them away, put them out of sight, inshallah. That's my advice. Um, and I think that we have to be practical to the best of our abilities. You know, put them away, put them out of sight. If you can deface them, if you want to, you're, you're prepared to do that. No problem, inshallah. Um, but as for will it then, you know, prevent the, um, will it prevent the jinn from, uh, sorry, the angels from entering, then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows best. Um, we ask Allah Jalla wa ala that He allows the angels and causes the angels to enter into our homes and protects our homes from the shayateen. Um, a question that I saw earlier before uh, Mr. Mr. Uh, Mr. Mujahid or the Mujahida uh, made uh, made her entrance. Um, the the, the question was, um, can weak memory be linked with jinn? Again, it's such a general question. It's so difficult to, to answer. Can weak memory be linked with jinn? SubhanAllah. Maybe you haven't memorized something for a long time. Maybe, you know, you're trying to memorize the Quran and your sins are causing the Quran to leave your heart. Because you know this Quran, it is a light which Allah Jalla wa ala places into the hearts of the people. And if, and if we are sinning, then this light will not enter into our hearts. And so, you know, SubhanAllah, uh, it was Imam al-Shafi'i uh, rahimahullah who mentioned that he, he one day he accidentally just looked at the uh, a part of a woman which was not permissible for him to see. It was like her ankles or something like this. And so he said that I, you know, like X amount of knowledge or, or years, X amount of time worth of study, it left me because of that. And so, you know, subhanAllah, imagine our situation. It's very, very difficult when we are constantly seeing that which is displeasing to Allah, hearing that which is displeasing to Allah. But at the same time, my brothers and sisters, we have to be practical people. That doesn't mean then that we sit in our houses. You know, like a lot of the young brothers, they're getting this waswasa from shaitan that, you know, you're going to go out and you're going to, you know, you got to mix with the dunya and so you got to sit at home and then they just become burdens on themselves and their families and society in general. The Muslim isn't like this. Yes, go out, but you know, subhanAllah, and if attaqullah mastata'atum, fear Allah Jalla wa ala to the best of your ability. And so, you know, I, I don't want to uh, go any further into this, inshaAllah. Do what's within your ability and Allah Jalla wa ala will not hold you to account for more than we are able to do. Um, 
So, uh, Sister Rebecca asked, Salam, brother, alaykum salam. What does it mean to have dreams that someone has done black magic on you, but in the dream you always recite from the Quran in response to the sihab? This is a this is a glad tiding from Allah Jalla wa Ala that you know you are able to recite the Quran. Um, if you're constantly seeing these dreams, and I would just um, make self ruqya inshallah, just to make sure that there are you know no problems or no issues, no underlying uh, problems. Um, and this is something that I want to uh, emphasize that a person he may have ain and he doesn't even know that he has ain, or she may have ain the evil eye and they don't even know that they have this issue, and so they have a, a problem or a difficulty that they're fighting with and that they're struggling with, and they don't know that they have, you know, this uh, spiritual issue. And so, like I said, it's always good practice every so often, every few months to just sit down and make self ruqya over yourself just to keep on top of it, inshallah. Because, you know, <coughs> the Prophet ﷺ said, Al-Ain, the knowledge, uh, the evil eye is real. And he said, you know, if something uh, was to go in front of the Qadr, if something would precede the Qadr, سَبَقَتْهُ الْأَيْنِ the, the, the evil eye, the Ayn, this would go before. Meaning just showing you how powerful and how easy it is and how common it is. This was at the time of the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. What about in our times now, brothers and sisters, where we drive around in our nice cars and we don't make our adhkar? We post pictures online of our families, of ourselves, of our children, of our properties. And, you know, thousands or hundreds of people can see them. And we don't know who is seeing them. We don't know who that person, whether he's a well-wisher or he's somebody who is, you know, uh, somebody who is, uh, you know, uh, he just wants evil and he has evil in his heart. So we don't know. You know, subhanAllah, maybe you post a picture of yourself and your, uh, you know, your, let's say your property, for example. And, you know, you have f family on there, but then other people or even members from amongst your family, they look at that and, it, and, you know, this begins to fester in their heart. Imagine now you get the evil eye, your business fails, you, you know, you get made redundant, whatever it is. And you're not sure that you're dealing with these issues. You're not sure that you're dealing with these problems. And so that's why I said I always, always recommend that every so often just take some time out and make self ruqya. I mean, I do it myself. I do it myself. Every so often, I'll just sit down and I'll just make self ruqya. Not because I'm paranoid, not because... You know, I think that I have a, uh, I'm possessed or something like this. But just in case, maybe there's something in my life that is, uh, you know, uh, slowed down or blocked as a result of uh, the ain or, or something like this. And so just in case, as a precaution, and at the end of the day, we are reciting the Quran. And so even if there's no problem, then you're getting rewarded for every single letter of the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Uh, that you that you recite and so you know if I was to say to you guys now that aside from the Rukya program aside from a, an intense Rukya what would you recite then to you know like a just a general a general Rukya and it's going to take you about an hour to an hour and uh, an hour and a half okay so you know, you just sit down and you'd begin with Surah Al-Fatiha. You'd begin with Surah Al-Fatiha. You then begin and just recite Surah Al-Baqarah. Okay. Now, at this point, people switch off because they think Surah Al-Baqarah is so long. Surah Al-Baqarah is so difficult. Surah Al-Baqarah is going to take me two hours or an hour and a half, depending on your proficiency and how you read. SubhanAllah. Look, imagine, you know, just every once every month or once every two months, you do this. Okay. So... You begin with Surah Al-Fatiha, then you begin with Surah Al-Baqarah, okay? Then you go to uh, Al-Ikhlas, Al-Falaq, Al-Nas, the last three uh, surah of the Qur'an, okay? And then you focus on those individual situations, okay? The individual ayat. So you then go to Ayat Al-Kursi. You then go to the last two ayahs of Surah Al-Baqarah, Aman Al-Rasul, okay? Then you would go uh, to the... Uh, the adhkar from the sunnah of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. So you notice the things that you're doing first and foremost 
are those things that we have evidences for. We have evidence for Al-Fatiha. We have evidence for Surah Al-Baqarah. We have evidence for Surah Al-Ikhlas, Falaq Al-Nas. We have evidence for Ayat Al-Kursi. We have evidence for the last two ayahs of Surah Al-Baqarah. Then we have evidence for the Adhkar of, from the Sunnah of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Give precedence to the things that have been mentioned in the Quran and in the Sunnah. Okay, give precedence to those things. Then, what we do is we would go and recite the various ayat of sihar and things like this and just see how you feel, okay? <coughs> and, and blow over water, spittle over water and olive oil and you would drink the water, wash your face with water and you could apply the olive oil as well. It's going to take you two hours once every couple of months. Two hours once every couple of months. And it just refreshes you by the permission of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And indeed, you know, there's a, the seven day Rukya program, which is on my website as well. You can just follow that. That's, you know, it's seven days. However, you know, in terms of recitation, it's not much more than what I have just mentioned to you, uh, mentioned to you now. Uh, the sister asks, I often see dreams where I'm attacked by some supernatural and I find myself reciting. Of course, despite reciting, I'm not fully protected. You know, dealing with bad dreams, uh, brothers and sisters, we deal with bad dreams uh, in, in three ways or in these three stages. So before the dream occurs, meaning before we go to sleep and our routine for sleeping, immediately after the dream occurs, the nightmare occurs, and then uh, let's say at the intermediary stage, after, you know, let's say a, a, no, a normal amount of time or a normal period, a day or so, after those dreams occur. So before we go to sleep, so the first stage is dealing with bad dreams before they even occur. You should make sure that you sleep in a state of wudu. You should make sure that you have uh, recited al-ikhlas, falaq, and nas three times each as the Prophet ﷺ would do. And then he would cup his hands and he would blow into his hands and then he would pass his hands over his body. As much of his body as he was able to reach, he would, uh, he would do that. Of course, he would also sleep having recited Ayat al-Kursi as well. These are the basics. These are the basics. And it doesn't take more than a minute or two minutes to do this. And he would sleep on his right side with his uh, with his hand under his uh, cheek, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. This is beforehand. This is beforehand. The, uh, the next thing uh, is immediately after. Immediately after the dream occurs. Okay. So you wake up and you say, A'udhu billahi min ash rajim And you just... Uh, spittle over your left shoulder three times. Okay, so a'udhu billahi min ash rajim Okay, and you would go to sleep in a different position than the one you woke up in. Okay, now if this is the first time that you're having this dream, khalas, that will suffice you. You can read ayat al kursi, etc. You know, uh, you can say Bismillah, tawakkal to Allah, and and just get up. Uh, so go back to sleep. Okay, and don't tell anybody about this dream. If, however, it's an ongoing thing, these dreams now you're getting them on a regular basis, and you know even when you seek refuge with Allah and you do all of those things that I've already mentioned, you're still getting these dreams and it's happening on a regular basis. What would you do in this situation? What I would then advise you to do is when you get this bad dream, you have this bad dream. It's a bad dream from Shaytan. Shaytan is the one who's giving you this bad dream. What I would then do is I would get out of bed. I would go and make wudu and I would then pray two rakahs of tahajjud. I would pray qiyamul layl, okay? Just two rakahs and then get back into bed and go back to sleep. What's the, um, what's the thinking behind this, okay? Is that shaitan, he wants to give you this bad dream to frighten you, to terrify you, uh, to, uh, you know, to, um, to, to make you feel disheartened. Okay, to do all of these things, to do all of these things, shaitan, he is trying to uh, cause you issues. Now, he's given you this bad dream, but then you wake up and you go and make the wudu, which is a great act of ibadah. You, it's a great act of worship. And the Prophet ﷺ mentioned that when a person, the hadith is in Sahih Muslim, when a person, he makes wudu, then as the water drops from his from his, yani his fingers and his and the, and his beard, his face, his body, etc. Then the sins drop as well, even from underneath his fingernails. Subhanallah, even from underneath his fingernails. O Kamaqal alayhi salam. So when we make wudu, this is an amazing thing, and the sins are literally falling from us, meaning the minor sins. 
Okay, then you go and you face the Qibla and you say Allahu Akbar and you pray two rakahs of Qiyamul Layl. Shaitan then will very quickly realize that he is trying to make you, trying to drive you away from Allah and his bad dreams and his coming to you and his poking and his prodding is actually driving you towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And so, you know, it's like we're saying, Shaitan, thanks very much. I've used you as an alarm clock. Now I'm going to go and I'm going to go and pray to Hajjud. And so very quickly the shayateen, they begin to realize, you know, like often we think of shayateen as computer programs we think of them as bad guys on the video games or in movies. This isn't the case. Their aim is to take us away from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And they are living creatures. We have to understand this. They are a living creation. The jinn, they are a living creation. And so they, they can see and they, they, they can, uh, you know, they adapt and, and, you know, it's like a game of chess. And so what we are doing is we are using their own tools and their own tactics against them. He's coming to you and he's trying to drive you away from Allah. But you're saying, thank you very much. You've woken me up. Now I'm going to go and pray at Qiyamul Layl. So this is from the immediately after you get the bad dreams. And like I said, this is if it's going on on an ongoing basis. Then how do we deal with it then, like say the next day? If this is something which is ongoing and you're getting ongoing bad dreams and recurring bad dreams, then the simple uh, thing is make ruqya. Make ruqya upon yourself. And so these are the three stages. Before the bad dream occurs, immediately afterwards, and then sometime afterwards, the long-term program, the long-term plan is to then make ruqya upon yourself. Uh, barakallahu feekum. Uh, Brother Ahmed, sorry, I'm not skipping you on, on purpose. Um, just the questions, they get pushed up or sometimes I, I just scroll and I, I miss them. Um, so the sister asked, could you clarify if you recite the whole of Surah Al-Baqarah or the last two ayahs and Ayat Al-Kursi? So as I said, you will recite Surah Al-Fatiha, all of Surah Al-Baqarah, Ikhlas, Falaq, and Nas. Okay, so you've just started from Al-Fatiha, then all of Surah Al-Baqarah, Al-Ikhlas, Al-Falaq, and Al-Nas. Then you would go back and recite, uh, you would then go back and recite Ayat Al-Kursi, the last two of Surah Al-Baqarah and then the Adhkar and then you would uh, go to the uh, to the other ayat which are mentioned. Okay. Um, that's a long question, subhanAllah. Um, it's... So the thing that I'm taking from this, uh, sister, is that your family, um, and this is uh, so you know Sister Aisha, so your family are practicing and they have the correct aqidah, you yourself are struggling, okay? Now, the next question that I'm going to ask without even looking or talking about ruqya is what are you struggling in? Are you struggling in with regards to your aqidah? Are you struggling with regards to your salah? Are you struggling with regards to the things that Allah has made wajib upon you? Because the things that Allah has made wajib upon you, okay? Or you're falling into the things that Allah has made haram upon you. These things take precedence over ruqya. Okay, because ruqya is barely something or it's something which is recommended. It's a sunnah. But as for doing the things which are obligatory, then this takes precedence and staying away from the haram, then this takes precedence. So I would then say, right, before we even talk about making ruqya, let's talk about hijab. And I'm not saying you're not wearing hijab. Let's talk about before all of that. Let's talk about aqidah. Let's talk about the salah. Let's talk about you're making tawbah. Let's talk about you abandoning the sins and then doing the rest of the things that Allah Jalla wa ala has made uh, obligatory upon you. Because you know, subhanAllah, and I've said this before and Brother Muhammad Tim said it last time, sometimes it may be a sin which is leading you into uh, into this, uh, this difficulty that you are falling into. Okay? It may be a sin. And we all know the ayat, yani, 
whatever of calamity befalls you, then it's because of what your own hands have sent forth. Okay, so the the point being, sister, is I would always, I would always uh, say, get the things in the right order. Don't get it twisted. The first thing, the the obligatory things and the correct aqidah and staying away from the haram and that type of thing. Then the next thing is then right. Okay, I'm doing everything I need to be. I'm staying from uh, staying away from things that I need to be staying away from. Now let's talk about uh, doing ruqya. Okay, and that's how you're going to weaken the shayateen. Nothing is going to weaken the shayateen more than you doing your wajibat and staying away from the things that Allah has made haram. Um, nobody, the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, did not give taweez to absolutely anybody. Rather, the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, he uh, he put his uh, hands on the heads of Hassan and Hussein radiallahu anhuma and then he uh, made the dua that we find in fortress of a Muslim etc and he made that dua so the Prophet alayhi salatu wasalam, he did not give taweez to a single soul rather when he saw somebody wearing these types of things he heavily rebuked them okay uh, so the next person asks is it true that if a husband doesn't pray, a woman who's affected with jinn or magic doesn't get any better, even if she's doing all of what Allah asked us to do, even praying Fajr on time? Hi. I'm not sure why you said hi. Like in, um, no. وَلَا تَزِرُ وَازِرَةٌ وِزْرَ أُخْرَى Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that, you know, no, uh, no uh, bearer of burdens will bear the burden of another. So you're not going to be held accountable for the fact that your husband doesn't pray and it's not going to affect your condition. You are your person and your condition affects yourself. Uh, and so, you know, that's not going to, uh, that's not, there's no connection there. Um, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows best, although... You know, it's always nice to have a supportive spouse when you're going through these things who can recite over you and assist you. Then, um, then, that's, then that's fine. But as for he doesn't pray, so I'm not getting better, that's, that's not the case and uh, to the best of my knowledge. And Allah Jalla wa ala knows best. Any more uh, questions, uh, Ikhwani Fillah? So, um, somebody asks, I've had Rukia done on me a few times and both times, so a couple of times, and both times I cried a lot, like non-stop, I felt like my chest was about to explode. Is this because of evil eye? Um, wallahi, I, I don't know. I don't know. It might be. It might be sihar, it might be something else. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows best. Um, but my reply to you would be, um, are you making regular self Rukia uh, after that? Uh, system Hadiyah asks if I if I did the seven day program a few years ago and had severe reactions to extreme weakness pains not for a few days but for a few weeks and now don't feel any reactions anymore doing it but still have the same symptoms as before is this a good sign or a sign that Rukya isn't as effective any, anymore what makes Rukya effective okay that's the first question so in response to that question my question to you brothers and sisters and I want you to, I want you to uh, answer this. What makes Rukya effective? What makes Rukya effective? I want you guys to answer for me. I'm asking you now. What makes Rukya effective? What are the factors that make Rukya effective? Okay, so Sister Hina says the belief that only Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala heals. Okay, when I am ill, then He is the one who gives me shifa. Okay, and 
And if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala should touch you with some adversity, then none can, none can uh, raise it except for him subhanahu wa ta'ala. Okay? So, we've said, we've had intentions. Okay? We've had intention. We've had the belief that Allah is the one who heals. <coughs> and as some of the brothers and sisters are, and I'm seeing the, the right buzzwords, the right buzzwords being aqeedah, the right buzzwords being at-tawheed, the right buzzwords being free of shirk. Okay? Because somebody said the belief that Allah heals. Okay? But how about this? I have a person who believes that Allah is the one who heals him, okay? But he makes dua to the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, and he believes that the Messenger of Allah makes dua to the uh, to Allah, and then Allah is the one who heals, okay? That belief, Allah is the one who heals, but is that belief sufficient? The point that I'm trying to get you see to the point that I'm trying to get you to see, Ikhwani, is that it's not just this belief which we need to believe. The aqidah of a Muslim it refers to all of the things that he holds to be true, the creed, and he believes them firmly in his heart, okay, and he doesn't have any doubts concerning them. Okay? This is the creed of a Muslim. So the first thing that makes the first thing that makes ruqya effective is aqeedah, 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 right? And wallahi, even the people of innovation, even the people of shirk, they know that the people of the sunnah, their aqeed, their, their ruqya is not like the ruqya of these people, okay? Some of you, or maybe you don't know, in the UK, we have a, a big temple, okay, and it's called a masjid, but in reality it's a temple, okay, and it's called, uh, there's, I'm not going to tell you, but it's a big, big Brailvi temple, okay, it's a big Brailvi temple where they worship the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and others besides Allah jalla wa ala, okay, and the man who built that temple, the man who built that temple, okay, he, his next door neighbor was affected, his next door neighbor was affected, okay, and they had some ruqya related issues. And this was years ago I'm talking about. You know, that man from the heads of shirk and the heads of bid'ah and the heads of misguidance, he gave my number and said, call him. Because they know full well that their ruqya doesn't work, that their recitation it doesn't work. It's just words that are coming out of their mouths. Why? Because they don't have the correct aqeedah. They are misguided. They are committing shirk with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And so the person's aqeedah and the person's tawheed, his understanding of the oneness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala plays a massive, massive part in how uh, effective his ruqya is. So if there's anybody watching here who, you know, thinks that he's a Sufi or he's, you know, yani, any of these things, we don't want to get into this. But he thinks that he's from one of these groups and he doesn't know his aqeedah. If there's any brother or any sister here who doesn't know his aqeedah, she doesn't know her aqeedah. And then she says, you know, um, my ruqya isn't effective. Subhanallah. This is, this is the first thing. This is the first thing. Okay. So your, your aqeedah. Something else. What else did we have? Let's just go through. Intentions. It's important to sit down and have the correct intention that you're making the ruqya. Okay? <coughs> what else? So, aqeedah, intention. What else, ikhwani? It, uh, it has an effect on the effectiveness of the, uh, the ruqya. Somebody says sunnah, sunnah, okay? I think what the, the brother, he means is a person's adherence to the sunnah of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And I'm going to say something to you now, ikhwani fillah, okay? 
There is nothing which is harder upon a shaitan. There is nothing which is harder upon a shaitan than a man or a woman who understands and implements a tawheed and follows the sunnah of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. There is nothing. There is nothing harder. And, and, and more difficult for the shayateen than people who adhere to the book of Allah and they adhere to the sunnah of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam. Nothing is harder on this person. Nothing is harder upon the shayateen than a man of tawheed and a man of sunnah. Nothing is harder upon them. Wallahi, nothing is harder upon them. So we have aqeedah, we have the niyyah, which is the intentions, and that falls under also... Uh, aqeedah as well and the third thing is following the sunnah of the prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam i'm going to give you two ahadith brothers and sisters i'm going to give you two ahadith and what these what i'm about to tell you now is the entire religion okay two ahadith which are so easy i want you to memorize them they are the entire religion and i'll say that again Two ahadith, which are the entire religion. Okay, the first hadith, the first hadith, the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam he said, "Innama al-a'malu bin niyat wa innama li kulli wa innama li kulli mri'im ma nawa." That indeed every action is according to its intention, and every single person he will have that which he intended. This is the first 50% of the religion. 50% of the religion is this hadith. That when you do an action, when you do an action, you have to do it sincerely for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah says, وَمَا أُمِرُوا إِلَّا لِيَعْبُدُوا اللَّهَ مُخْلِصِينَ لَهُ الدِّينَ That they were not commanded except that they worship Allah, making the religion sincere for Him. Brothers and sisters, I'm asking you a question now. If you do an action and the intention is for anybody other than Allah, will that action be accepted? If I do an action and the intention is not only purely for Allah, will that action be accepted by Allah? The answer is no. Okay, so this is the first 50% of the religion. Do you know what the next 50% of the religion is? The hadith of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam where he said, مَنْ عَمِلَ عَمَلًا لَيْسَ عَلَيْهِ أَمْرُنَا فَهُوَ رَدْ Whoever does an action, whoever does an action that is not according to our way, it's going to be rejected. So these two hadith, they form the entire religion. That you want to do something which is pleasing to Allah, you number one, have to have the correct intention. Number two, you have to be following the sunnah of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Okay? Man ahdatha fi, in another type of, another sort of variation of this hadith, man ahdatha fi amrina, مَا لَيْسَ مِنْهُ فَهُوَ رَدْ Whoever brings into this affair of ours, meaning this religion, that which is not from it, it's going to be rejected. Brothers and sisters, do you see how this is the entire religion? Do you see how these two hadith, they form the entire religion? The first 50%, you have to, you have to, have to, have to, have, to have the correct intention. And the second 50% of this religion, once your intention is correct, you have to follow the sunnah of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa Do you see, I hope, do you see how uh, that will, uh, that is the entire part of this, uh, of this religion? And I hope that is clear to you. Okay, so when you are then, when you are then, okay, making ruqya. First thing, at-tawheed. The second thing, free of shirk. The third thing, having the correct intention. The fourth thing, following the sunnah of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in all of your affairs. Following the messenger alayhi salam in all of your affairs. Okay, so in your external affairs, meaning in the way that you look, in the way that you dress, in the way that you talk, 
in the way that you behave, in the way that you conduct yourself, in the way that you, <coughs> your character, etc., etc. These are your external affairs. And as for those internal affairs as well that nobody sees, your relationship between you and your Creator, subhanahu wa ta'ala, the way that you read your salah, the way that you read the Quran, the way that you, uh, you know, all of these different things, all of these different things. Okay, so this is the entire religion. The correct intention, following the sunnah of the messenger, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Somebody else said the salah. Okay, somebody else said, and I, the question that we're dealing with here is what dictates or what, uh, what affects or what, uh, you know, has a, an impact on the effectiveness of the, uh, the, the, the ruqya of a person. So we said Tawheed, we said Sunnah, we said the intention. What else, Ikhwani? Somebody else said Salah. But what I want to add to that is doing all of, doing all of the obligatory deeds and staying away from all of the haram actions. Okay, so the good deeds and the performance of them, it has an effect on your Ruqya. Why? Because it affects your Iman. Okay, we know brothers and sisters, we know brothers and sisters that a person's iman goes up when they do good deeds and it goes down when they uh, do when they commit sins okay so iman is rising and falling okay so doing the good deeds when your iman is up by the permission of allah your ruqya will be more effective as well when your iman is down then your ruqya is going to be less effective this is why this is why when that man he was stung in the hadith of abu sa'id al khudri radiyallahu an the companion abu sa'id al khudri they said you know the the companion the, the companions they came across a man and he was stung by a scorpion or a snake i mean something poisonous and all they recited was surah al fatiha all they recited was surah al fatiha Look how effective their recitation of Surah Al-Fatiha was. Us jokers, we sit here and we recite for hours on end Al-Baqarah and Al-Fatiha and Al-Ikhlas, Falaq and Nas and Adhkar and then we go through, you know, like Surah Ali Imran, SubhanAllah, and it doesn't have any effect. And they just recited Al-Fatiha. Look, why? Because their Iman, it was their Iman which had that effect. It was that Iman which took those words, took Al-Fatiha and just obliterated whatever illness it was. It was their Iman, Ikhwani. And so your Iman, it rises with good deeds and it falls with evil deeds. So we said all of the good deeds, you do them and you do your best and staying away from the evil deeds. What else, Ikhwani, dictates the effectiveness of the Ruqya? What else dictates the effectiveness of the Ruqya? <coughs> so a brother mentions the consistency of the ruqya dictates the effectiveness of the ruqya I'm going to say no I'm going to say no because you may have a person who makes ruqya for a long period of time and their ruqya just keeps getting weaker and weaker and weaker and weaker and weaker. So a person mentions taqwa. And taqwa and tawakkul, we can maybe put them together. So your trust and your reliance in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and, uh, and your fear of Him and your awe of Him and your awareness of Him, being conscious of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Let's put those things together. Okay? And no doubt they do... Uh, effect, but I think that would also fall into Iman. So when a person's Iman goes up, their Tawakkul goes up and their, their Taqwa also goes up. When their Iman is low, then maybe their Tawakkul goes down as well and their level of Taqwa also decreases. So this falls under the level that we've already mentioned of Iman and how those companions, they had such a high level of Iman and so their Taqwa was so great and their Tawakkul was so great as well. Okay, so I think that is is contained within it okay look how about husna dhan billah having good having good thoughts of allah subhanahu wa ta'ala having good thoughts of allah subhanahu wa ta'ala okay 
having good thoughts of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, being optimistic. This is such an amazing thing which so many people miss out on. Optimistic, optimism, having good thoughts of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I'm going to get better. Allah jalla wa ala is going to, uh, you know, uh, is, is going to heal me. And having this yaqeen and this certainty that what I am reciting is the Quran, what I am following is the sunnah. Khalas, I, I, I hope and I feel certain of uh, a, uh, of a response from Allah and this is why the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam he would say when you make dua make dua with certainty because you know Allah Jalla wa Ala he doesn't answer uh, an absent heart make dua with certainty make dua with certainty that you know what I'm gonna get better okay I'm gonna get better so that was a, a, a good one uh, the sister mentions uh, at tawbah Okay, making tawbah to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Again, so important, subhanallah. This is going to affect the, 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 the position of your ruqya. And again, making tawbah. And because our sins, you know, subhanallah, our sins, they, they blacken our hearts and they cause a, an, a, an effect upon us or they have an effect upon us, making tawbah. And you know, a, another thing which I'm going to mention, which nobody has mentioned, okay, is the will of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now this might seem like a really obvious thing, but I'm going to mention why I say the will of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Okay? You may have a person who is a person of a tawheed and he follows the sunnah, she follows the sunnah, she's not engaged, he's not engaged in major sins, and they, uh, you know, they are constantly making tawbah for the minor sins. Their salah is on time. They pay their zakah. They have certainty. They're optimistic of a cure. Yet they still don't get cured. <coughs> they still don't get cured. And this is because it's just upon the will of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah Jalla wa Ala has not willed them to, get, to, to have a cure at this particular moment. Have you ever thought about the hadith where the messenger sallallahu alayhi wa he mentioned that the people who are tested the most are the prophets and the messengers and then the scholars as well after that. And then Allah jalla wa ala, he tests the people according to how much he loves them subhanahu wa ta'ala. So how do we know the difference between a test? Because I've just said the prophets were tested the most. And the Prophet ﷺ said this. And then the scholars are tested the most. Okay? And the Prophet ﷺ, he said this. But then how do we make jama'ah? How do we reconcile? And how do we bring together the fact that they were tested the most and they had calamities which affect them? And Allah says, whatever calamity afflicts you is because of your own sins. How do we reconcile between two seemingly... Yani two seemingly... Uh, irreconcilable, uh, uh, yani irreconcilable uh, evidences. One is the Quran and one is an authentic hadith. Ikhwani fillah, what we need to know and what we need to understand is there is a difference between a test and a punishment. There is a difference between a test and a punishment. Okay, let's deal with the, we give precedence to the Quran, let's deal with the, with the punishment. Allah mentions that the calamities which befall us Okay, Allah mentions which, about the calamities which befall us, that they are because of what your own hands have sent forth. Okay, so when we commit a sin and we are full of sin, and then something bad happens afterwards and some calamity befalls us, we say this is because of our own sins. So a person, he does something haram and then something, a calamity befalls him after that, he says this is because of my own sins. Okay, so when a person is sinning and as a result of that, let's say for example now, uh, a person, he is, uh, I don't know, he's engaged in some sort of sin and then a punishment comes upon him as or a disease or an illness. He says that is as a result of my own sins. So we know our situations better, ikhwani fillah. Okay, but as for the prophets and the messengers, they were tested. Okay, so they never had sins they never made mistakes, they were tested. And this test was in order to what? Not expiate for their sins, it was in order to raise their rank. To raise their rank. 
Okay, so when a person he is doing his best and he is making uh, you know all of the effort he can and he's going in the path of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and then calamities fall upon him, then tests come upon him, this is to raise his rank and to expiate for any minor mistakes that he may have made. But when a person is sinning and engaging in ma- major sins and then the calamities fall on top of him, this is as a result of his own sins. So there may be a person as I said the will of Allah there may be a person who is you know doing everything within his ability and he's from the awliya of Allah not the not the Sufi innovated awliya of Allah you know we wear a big turban grow a big beard carry a nice tasbih Allahu Allahu not this awliya I mean the awliya where they are doing everything that they should be and they stay away from everything that they can to the best of their abilities okay this type of awliya and then they are tested and then calamities fall upon them maybe their rukya illness maybe their problem their spiritual issue is as a result of Allah Jalla wa ala raising them and Allah <coughs> and the messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam mentioned that you know a person he will be tested is Imam Bukhari he mentions it in Al-Adab Al-Mufrad he mentions that a person will be tested in his self and in his family and his children and his and the rest of his affairs until he reaches Allah free of sin he reaches Allah free of sin okay so maybe it's the will of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala Maybe also it's the will of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because how many people they weren't practicing. They were far from the religion. As a result of an illness that came upon them, they came closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And this is why Ibn Taymiyyah rahimahullah, he mentioned a beautiful statement. He said, a calamity which brings you closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is better for you than a blessing which takes you away from Allah jalla wa ala. A calamity which brings you closer to Allah is better for you than a than a blessing which takes you away from him. And the scholars also said it may be that a man will enter into the hellfire because of a good deed and he will enter into paradise because of a sin. This seems like an oxymoron seems impossible. How is that possible? And think about it though. Maybe a man will enter into Jannah based upon a sin. So a person does a sin and then he regrets it so much and a calamity falls upon him. He changes his ways, he becomes practicing, he makes tawbah and he rectifies himself. As a result of that sin, he enters into Jannah. Maybe a person, he does one good deed and then khalas, he becomes arrogant and he becomes haughty and he thinks he's so good and he stops trying and he stops striving and he thinks that you know he's the best thing to ever hit this earth and because of that good deed he enters into the hellfire so ikhwani fillah it's it's a it's a fact that we have to say allah knows and we do not know maybe we love something and it's bad for us maybe we hate something and it's good for us this is from the knowledge of allah subhanahu wa ta'ala so the will of allah jalla wa ala it has this uh, effect as well and this is from the most this is the most important thing and it, you know on the surface of it it seems so obvious but I just wanted to explain that you know in, in a little bit of detail that there's a bit more to it than that and we could spend more time on it um, but I think that you know that suffices now that we see that everything that we do is connected to the will of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala <coughs> what else ikhwani what else uh, what else affects the effectiveness of the Ruqya? Or impact the effectiveness of the Ruqya? Is there anything else that you guys can think of which impacts the effectiveness of the Ruqya. So the brother mentioned, brother Hussein, he mentions, I yani, need to understand the ayat and you know these types of things. I'm going to make it more general than that, and I want to talk about the person's recitation. How are you reciting? Are you reciting with the correct tajweed? Are you making major mistakes? Are you making minor mistakes? How is your recitation? This is really quite important. This is really quite important. 
um, the the recitation it needs to be it needs to be um, it needs to be subhanallah according to the sunnah of the messenger sallallahu alayhi wasallam and on top of that something that i want to add is knowledge okay knowledge is so important the more knowledge you have the greater your recitation is going to be i don't know if you guys have you know seen uh, sheikh ibn baz or there's a video on youtube of sheikh ibn baz rahimahullah making ruqya and you know it's an amazing <coughs> it's an amazing thing it's an amazing thing because sheikh ibn baz rahimahullah he makes ruqya in a very different way to what we do and so he just recites on a person he just says alhamdulillahi rabbil alamin and he blows after every single ayah ar rahman ar rahim and you can hear him subhanallah blowing and i think it's a, on a youth or a youth comes to him and he is reciting on his uh, one of his family members but i advise you to search for it inshallah even i think if you search in english um, if you just put uh, you know sheikh ibn baz making ruqya or something like this it will come on inshallah and you know just for your just for your benefit to see that you know some people they blow after every ayah or they spittle after every ayah. Some people they spittle after every surah or after every couple of ayat. Some people they may spittle right at the end of the ruqya, etc. And so this is where your experience comes in. You can use what works for you and there's no problem with that, inshallah. Ikhwani, uh, any more questions? Subhanallah. Okay, we'll have a, a couple of more questions inshallah or a couple of more minutes. Um, and then we will uh, bring this um, session to a close. Bi idhnillahi tabaraka wa ta'ala. So, look, what I want to also mention, okay, what I also want, want to mention, okay, is, uh, okay, two things, okay, can we splash water uh, upon a person can we at the same time you know uh, beating as they say and also i want to deal with this issue of uh, manzil okay let's deal with the issue of manzil first and foremost okay um what we know is that you know uh, people they have taken the manzil they've taken the manzil and what they've done with it they've placed certain uh, surahs from the Quran into the into the uh, manzil and they've ordered them in the correct order and then people believe that these have certain um, they have certain qualities or certain values okay so for example from the things that they put into these the manzil as they say and it seems to be a uh, I think it's a, like a more of an indo pack type of thing uh, it's uh, you know like things like uh, Surah Ar-Rahman and I think we have also this Surah Al-Waqi'ah. I think we have uh, Surah Al-Mulk. Uh, of course, the famous one, uh, Surah Yaseen. And others besides that. Okay? Um, you know there's a lot, there are a lot of weak ahadith and fabricated narrations and weak narrations where the virtues of <coughs> like some of these uh, surah, they're mentioned. And in reality, there isn't anything which brings these types of things in. And as for to say the manzil is an innovation, I wouldn't go that far. I wouldn't go that far. But I would say that it's not from the sunnah of the messenger sallallahu alayhi wasallam. Because at the end of the day, it's just a collection of different uh, different chapters from the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But so I wouldn't say that it's an innovation, it's an outright innovation because the person is just reciting from the Quran. As for the ordering of these particular uh, these particular uh, surahs in a particular way and then saying that reciting these has a, a certain impact and saying this, this type of thing with the surety, then yes, this is an innovation which has no basis in the, uh, in the sunnah of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam. So somebody wants to, you know, for example, we always find people, uh, you know, when somebody dies, they all gather and they all recite surah yaseen. This is an innovation, okay? This is an innovation. And so, you know, we need to suffice ourselves with the book of Allah and the sunnah of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam. The next thing that I wanted to talk about was um, the use of water and the sprinkling of water 
in Ruqya. Okay, so a person he may, um, you know, if you're reciting on somebody, you may want to take some water and splash it on them. But again, this is a, uh, this is a, uh, this is like a two percent. You know, don't some people they take these spray bottles and they're spraying more than they're reciting. And so, uh, you know, I, I, uh, I, 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 I don't recommend these things. I don't recommend these things. And I don't say this. You know, saying the thing in and of itself is no good. But I say this because I fear the door that's going to be opened if we say to people, yeah, you know, like a, like a, uh, like a, just a, just a, a blanket type thing saying, no problem. Everybody, you can just make, you know, make the, make the ruqya and use the water in this way. It's very similar to those people who say, you know, some of the companions or some of the salaf, they would allow um, writing the verses of the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, writing it with uh, waterproof or sorry, soluble ink. And then they would place these verses into water and then they would wash or drink these, uh, this water or they would bathe with this water. Now, yes. Number one, we don't have an evidence from the book of Allah, the sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ. But do you see now, if we start saying to people, there's, yes, some people allowed it. Do you then see the door that we open up for the magicians? Because the magician is going to say the exact same thing because the magician gives the taweez and he says, put this in water and drink it. And often when the person drinks it, he becomes possessed. And the magician, he just says the same thing. This is Quran and it's just written in soluble ink. And so you should, uh, you should drink it. And so do you see the door that we open up? Do you see the, the door that we open up for major fitna? major problems and so it's better to close all of these doors and say look don't wear amulets don't do this don't do this don't do this so likewise when it comes to water i would say look if you are aware of how to use it and when to use it and it doesn't you know overcome your recitation then no problem inshallah otherwise you know just stick to drinking the water washing your own face with the water that's sufficient otherwise we're going to get people you know they take their spray bottles and spraying into people's eyes and spraying into people's noses and in their ears and it just makes a big problem and it causes a big fitna subhanallah so we have to uh, we have to be uh, you know uh, we have to be very careful with regards uh, with regards to this okay um Ikhwani fillah, I think that will be enough for now. Um, Barakallahu feekum. Uh, I said three minutes and I think we've had about ten, five minutes on top of that. Um, inshallah, I'll, I'll aim to do another, I'll aim to do another um, Rukya question and answer, inshallah. Um, just to take these types of questions, inshallah. Um, but, uh, you know, if anybody has any specific questions, then as I mentioned, my number is on my uh, Facebook page, uh, on this page where I am now, and you can contact me via WhatsApp. Please don't ring me because I'm not going to answer. You can uh, contact me via WhatsApp, inshallah, send me a message, and then just be patient, please, and I'll do my best to uh, get back to you as soon as I am able to. Um, um, I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that He uh, allows us to benefit from that which we learn and He teaches us that which will benefit us. And I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to uh, whoever is ill and suffering to give them uh, a complete shifa. Uh, ultimately, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows best. I'll leave this up on my wall, inshallah. So anybody who wants to watch uh, and go through the uh, questions or the answers, and they're able to do so. Wa jazakumullahu khaira. Subhanakallahumma wa bihamdika. Shadu wa la ilaha illa anta astaghfiruka wa atubu ilayk. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.